Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is R. James Woolsey, a strategic analyst and a former director of the Central Intelligence of the United States. He is chairman of Woolsey Partners, an investment firm which focuses on renewable energy and energy security. He was a an attorney for 22 years, and he has had presidential uh, appointments from both Republican and Democratic uh, presidents. Jim, welcome to Berkeley. Good to be with you. Harry. Where were you born and raised? I was born and grew up in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And looking back, how do you think your uh, parents shaped your thinking about the world? Oh, a lot. Uh, I was an only child, and uh, uh, for example, uh, my father taught me to play golf when I was very young. Uh, and uh, from the time I was probably eight or nine years old, uh, up until I was a teenager and going to basketball practice and that sort of thing, I was, um, uh, I did a lot of stuff with him on weekends. Um, and uh, play golf, go fishing, whatever. And I still remember one uh, Saturday, uh, I went in and I thought we were gonna go play golf and he, uh, he was working really hard. He was a lawyer, he was a litigator. And he said, hey, sorry, he wasn't gonna be, we weren't gonna be able to play today because he had, was, uh, had a trial starting on Monday. And I said, well, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm preparing my opponent's case. And I said, well, why are you preparing your opponent's case? He said, that's always how you start. He said, if you do a really good job of that, it makes you do a lot better job in what you're doing. And I've never forgotten that. Uh, it's something that people neglect a lot. But whether you're dealing with uh, Al-Qaeda or Soviets or whomever, uh, getting inside their shoes is a very important and very necessary first step. And, and did, did, was, was his influence why you became a lawyer? And, and did, did you get involved in, in following current events and, and politics early? Well, uh, yes, uh, I got involved in it early and I didn't know I was getting involved in it because what would happen is my father would and mother both would kind of encourage me to at least read a few stories in daily papers, even when I was very little. And my father would elicit some, me saying something about it around the dinner table. And then he'd always take the other side. Hmm. And uh, it got to, after a while, I realized he was doing it to get me used to arguing about things in a sensible way. Uh, but uh, uh, my wife uh, is from the family of uh, engineers. And she said they were always talking about how to do things. And, and, and hmm. it, it, it was, you know, um, Einstein used to say, God may be sophisticated, but he's not plain mean. <laughs> and I think what he meant, <laughs> meant by that was when you're playing against nature, him, God, and nature were the same thing. Um, there's nobody, it may be really hard, but there's nobody on the other side trying to defeat you, where in some things, there is. And, those are different types of problems. A friend of mine calls them uh, malignant problems versus malevolent problems. And my father was always trying to teach me how to defeat someone, at least in argument. And I was probably 13 years old before I realized that after I'd had dinner with some other friends at their houses that that's not what everybody did. I thought everybody argued with their father <laughs> around the dining room table. Um, so, um, I, uh, I was, uh, I'm really quite indebted to both my parents. I had a very comfortable, pleasant upbringing. I went to the same high school, Tulsa Central, that they both went to. I had two of the same teachers my mother had. Uh, you know, it was, uh, and it was a good education. And then where did you do your undergraduate work? Stanford. Stanford. And what did you major in? History. Uh, and uh, except for the year or two after I read Grapes of Wrath when I was about 15 and I thought I wanted to be a labor organizer, uh, by the time I was a freshman in college, I wanted to be a professor of modern European history. And that's uh, uh, where I was headed until uh, partway through my uh, first uh, year at Oxford uh, after Stanford. And you were a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford? Yes. yes. Uh, I, uh, I decided I really didn't want to have a life of research and libraries and, and writing. I liked doing it, but not that much, as not to, exclusively so. And so I dropped back into the philosophy, politics, and economics program at Oxford and then went to, uh, decided to go to law school. And although I never planned to be a litigator like my father, uh, that's what I became. 
And and what? How were you affected by the the political currents of the time? Uh, civil rights movement, the the Vietnam War movement, and so on. Did they did 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 uh, did did they help change the course of what you were thinking about and wanted to do? My parents were both very, very tolerant in, in both matters, racial and religious and the rest. And uh, I was uh, brought up uh, not to uh, uh, consider those distinctions, ethnic, religious, racial, any of them as something that ought to be uh, 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 considered. Uh, I still remember uh, I was about eight, and I was playing alone, as I often did, being an only child out in the backyard, and a family moved in uh, behind us. And I ran in and said to my mother, I said, Mom, somebody finally moved into the Smith's house. And I said, I said he's, there's a boy, he's older than I am, though, and he's got the weirdest baseball cap on, doesn't have a bill. Mm -hmm. And my, <laughs> my mother said, well, it probably means they're Jewish. Mm -hmm. And I said, what's Jewish? Mm -hmm. And she said, well, you're studying about them. Uh, uh, now in uh, in Sunday school, uh, I, Moses. I said, like Gideon. <laughs> <laughs> you mean they're Israelites? And she said, well, sort of. And I, I said, well, can I? What should I do? I, and she said, well, she said, look, they're just like us, except they don't believe that Jesus uh, was the Son of God. Other than that, uh, we're all the same. She said, go welcome them to the neighborhood. And that's mm -hmm. how I found out about Hanukkah. Mm -hmm. uh, went in, asked to see our, my new neighbor's Christmas tree, and he said, well, I've got something different. <laughs> <laughs> I see, that's very good. So, so but in, in term, when you were at Yale uh, and an editor at the, at the Law Review, uh, you got involved in the, in the anti-war movement. movement. Yes. Talk, talk about that. Well, at Stanford, just before that, we'd had a big flap with the National Fraternity. A group and I had pledged together, Sigma Nu Fraternity mm -hmm. on campus, and we invited a... There were very few Africans or African Americans at Stanford in 1959, 1960. But there was a graduate student, black from Nigeria, I think, who needed a, a room, and we had a spare room. So we just offered it to him for free. Somebody had him as a teaching assistant and liked him. Uh, and uh, we got in a big fight with Sigma Nu National because uh, it had a racial discrimination clause. And we seceded from the national fraternity. And the, now this is 1960, 61. So it's before the free speech movement here at Berkeley. It's uh, before Mississippi summer. It's before a lot of things. And it seems like such a small thing now. And we weren't trying to create a, a big ruckus. We just had this Nigerian graduate student we thought was a nice guy. We wanted to give him a room. Um, but it became a really big deal on, on campus. Uh, it was uh, strange, uh, and even some national uh, attention to it in the press. Then when I was at Yale, I, I'd always been, as were my parents, essentially Harry Truman, Scoop Jackson Democrats. I still remember a little poem one of my parents taught me when I was a little boy, which was, uh, uh, Compassion at home, strength across the seas. It was good enough for the Roosevelts. It's good enough for me. <laughs> uh, and, right. and, and that's Truman. That's Humphrey. That's Scoop. That's yeah. and uh, I uh, was uh, was uh, in beginning my third year of law school, and I'd supported the Vietnam War from the summer of '64 until the summer of '67, but. I was getting very frustrated with search and destroy and the fact that it wasn't going anywhere and it was just alienating the Vietnamese population. Uh, so Allard K. Lowenstein, who had been assistant dean of men at Stanford when I was there and had become a friend of my wife's and mine, uh, he came to town along about September of 67. And he and my wife Sue beat on me for several hours and I finally said, okay, they won't stop search and destroy. All right. What should we do? And Al said, well, we're going to set up an organization called Yale Citizens for Blank for President. Jim, I'd like for you to, hmm. to, to start it and get it going. And I haven't, I don't know who I'm going to run yet. I'm working on Bobby, Bobby Kennedy, but I, he may not come along. If not, I'll get somebody else. But we're going to enter him in the New Hampshire primary and going to do well enough that we'll knock Johnson out of the White House and change the path on the war. I said, this is the craziest damn thing I've ever heard in my life. Of course, it's not going to work but I don't have anything else to do, so all right. Al called me a few days later from an airport somewhere and said, okay, it's McCarthy. I said, McCarthy? I said, the senator from Minnesota, the poet? He said, yeah. I said, Al, this is the stupidest thing I've ever heard of in my life. He said, Jim, just do it. So I went down to the Yale registration and students thing, and I changed the name of the organization from Yale Citizens for blank for president to Yale Citizens for McCarthy, Eugene McCarthy. Uh, 
And we started getting organized and sent one of our law journal members up to New Hampshire to start the, the, the campaigning and the, the, the picketing, the, uh, the, the polling. And, and uh, um, I, we were in our Yale Citizens for Eugene McCarthy, we were essentially at that time both the anti-war movement and we were sort of the leaders of the most conservative group on campus because there were two real conservatives in the political union, but except for them, uh, pretty much everybody else was burning something. The men were burning draft cards, the women were burning bras, et cetera. SDS was on campus and they thought we were a real sellout because we were working inside the, the system, the political system. But we uh, worked pretty hard on that and uh, particularly my friend Eric Schnapper who went up and organized a lot of things in, uh, in uh, New Hampshire. Uh, and uh, uh, so, uh, yes, I, uh, I uh, uh, was active in the anti-war movement, for at least for that, uh, that year. And uh, prior to that, in 1963, after I graduated from Stanford and just before I went to Oxford, I was an intern at the State Department for the summer, and I was doing some tutoring of African-American kids uh, 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 at nights for, for uh, uh, I think it was for, uh, I'm not sure which of the civil rights organizations was running it, but they decided to have the big demonstration in August. And they came to a bunch of us who were tutors and asked if we would go through some nonviolence training and, and hmm. be, be there to lie down in front of bad guys if they came to try to break this up. And we said, well, yeah, okay, so we, we did. So I was technically a, quote, marshal of March on Washington in, in August of 63. And I stood, was standing on a, the, up just above the Lincoln Memorial and saw King give his, uh, I have a, a dream speech. Hmm. So um, although I won't claim any leadership role or anything like that, I, I, given the ages of, of people, I'm probably going to end up being the only director of central intelligence who, when he was younger, was active in both the civil rights movement and the anti-war mm -hmm. movement. And, and what did you learn from these experiences? And the reason I ask is, in your career, you're, it's very clear that you're concerned about ideas and how new ideas are, are generated. And, and how do you see movements who are kind of in a way outside the walls of power and, and the impact that they might have on changing things. Well, uh, the civil rights movement, although 68 was a terrible year with the assassinations of King and Bobby Kennedy and the, the riots in Washington and, and all the rest, ultimately what happened is it succeeded. And the country is very lucky that we had King as the head of the civil rights movement rather than somebody who tilted toward violence. Uh, but that was who black Americans and other Americans who were interested in civil rights, that's who people gravitated toward and he shaped the, the whole future of the rest of the 20th century and the early, still in the early 21st in race relations in the United States with the Civil Rights Act and all the rest. Ultimately, he gets a lot of credit as do the people at the senior level who helped him. Uh, but it's also a great testament to the resilience and adaptability and the ability of the American polity to learn and shift direction uh, compared to where things uh, were, say, in the 1950s and before. Uh, and the same uh, with the anti-Vietnam movement. There were people in it who did some, I think, awful and very excessive things. But by getting 42 percent of the vote in New Hampshire, we actually did indirectly get Johnson to resign, McNamara is, resigns, Westmoreland resigns, search and destroy is effectively ended and the new approach that was taken by Abrams and the others was one that was uh, far more uh, helpful and useful and effective in terms of dealing with the, uh, the Vietnamese people and the, the Viet Cong and we had really, for all practical purposes, we the United States had defeated uh, the Viet Cong. That's what happened with the uh, exchange of prisoners and, uh, and uh, Kissinger and Lee Duc Tho winning the Nobel Peace Prize and all that. Then a year and a half later, the North Vietnamese invaded the South and that was a, that's what caused the South to fall. But, but the change in direction 
of the war in 68 as a result of the, the, the uh, anti-war movement in, in the mid-60s, I think was, was again an extraordinary example of what the American people and American institutions can do. They can learn and they can change things. And there are lots of places in the world, including a lot of other democracies, that just keep on going in the same track they're in no, no matter what. And, and the United States is, at least in my view, not like that. If, if, if I could put a label on what you do, I would say that you're a strategic analyst. And I'm curious as to what, if, if you will accept that as a starting point, uh, what, what do you see as the skills uh, that are involved in what you do, namely, you know, thinking about the future. Uh, uh, also, I think I find in your writings knowledgeable about the past uh, and, and trying to link those two things in intelligence that ha helps make policy. Well, I, I think strategic analysts may be uh, overstating my capabilities. Yeah. I mean, I. I think I was a decent lawyer for 22 years. I tried mainly arbitrations and mainly uh, technical matter about cases about technical matters. I was in the government for 12 mm -hmm. and four different, uh, five different jobs, uh, but four presidential appointments for two Republican and two Democratic administrations. Some of that was arms control negotiating. Some of it uh, was Under Secretary of the Navy. Some was General Counsel of Senate Armed Services, and then finally was uh, Director of Central Intelligence. Those last two years, the first two years of Clinton administration. Uh, and then I was a consultant, a partner at Booz Allen for, for five years working on energy and now the last three years as a venture capitalist I've been working on energy. Uh, and uh, in all of those jobs I've tried to take a, a strategic look at things, try to figure out where people are going, where we should want them to go different groups, different countries, different interests in the United States. If you want to succeed, how can you put those different interests together and get them cooperating? For example, in terms of the energy issues I'm working on now, I talk about the importance of having a coalition of the tree huggers, the do-gooders, the sod busters, the evangelicals, uh, the cheap hawks, and Willie Nelson. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and the and, consumer. And, uh, right, well, consumers are out lots too. Uh, and, uh, in, uh, in work negotiating the Conventional Forces in Europe Treaty. I learned very early in the negotiation that if the United States just sits at a table of 20 up countries and makes a proposal, since we were kind of the, the biggest dog at the table, um, uh, people after a while kind of get the feeling resentment and, and they don't like being shoved by the United States. So I would go to my colleagues in various NATO countries, the ambassadors to negotiations, and suggest things to them and we'd kick things around and then they'd make a proposal. And sometimes if I wanted to, to uh, make sure that the French ambassador supported it, I'd even oppose it, even if it had been our idea originally um, for a while, then it'd come around. Uh, so uh, thinking about things like uh, how you can make it easier, since uh, uh, this was the U.S. government's policy at the time, to conduct these negotiations in such a way that Germany can unify if it wants, but also stay inside NATO. Mm -hmm. And the unification was opposed by several of our very good allies. Uh, this being inside NATO was strongly opposed by the then Soviet Union, soon to become Russia. But if you kind of work everything just right and the right timing and the right sequence, you can end up with a unified Germany in NATO. Uh, and you have to not just get bogged down in the details, you have to see how everything you're doing might help fit to help bring that about. Were, were you surprised as a negotiator when the Soviet, uh, the wall came down and the Soviet Union well, fell? I had been uh, <clears throat> in the job of heading up the Conventional Forces in Europe negotiations uh, for uh, precisely six days. Uh, and the, the wall came down and my wife unfortunately still has a letter I wrote that evening. I was sitting uh, in an apartment in Vienna eating off a television tray and watching CNN. I see the wall go down. I wrote her a note. This is back, of course, in 89 and we're in pre-email days. It said, uh, 
well, something really interesting going on with the Berlin Wall. Well, moving on to Christmas vacation. Looking forward to you and the boys coming over. Uh, thought we'd go skiing. And uh, I think I'd like for us all to go to Prague for a few days because I want the boys to see what a real Stalinist state is like. <laughs> By the time they were over at Christmas time, of course, the, the revolution had come. Uh, the streets are full of, uh, of uh, people shouting and laughing and carrying signs, Havel nach Rad, Havel to the castle as president. Um, we were standing on Charles Bridge. I still remember it was unseasonably uh, warm and a lot of people were out uh, and there were a lot of kids on the bridge playing guitars and singing. And uh, one group we were standing next to started singing We Shall Overcome in Czech. Hmm. And my wife and I both got a little bit teary and our three sons, who were young teenagers at the time, they were, no, I guess they were like, uh, they were like 9, 11, and 13, uh, looked at us and said, what's a big deal? They're just singing, we shall overcome. Mm -hmm. we, we both said, mm -hmm. remember this. <laughs> <laughs> You'll think about it from time to time. Yeah. Now, it, 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 we, we've, it, it, there, there's a sense in, in, in which uh, another element in, in your thinking, which, which I think uh, comes to play in, in uh, your work as a security analyst, is using history, thinking about the future, but also uh, uh, identifying threats, you yeah. know, that are out there and, and somehow putting these things together. Yeah. And, and I know that you wrote a paper and gave a talk to the World Affairs Council after a year or so after the wall fell. And uh, in that you drew on a kind of uh, an understanding of history that said, hey, you know, roses aren't coming out everywhere. There, right. There's still threats in the world. So that, that's also an important element of all of this. That is yeah. seeing through uh, uh, and, and really examining the darkest scenarios. Uh, I, uh, uh saw in the beginning of the 90s uh, that although we had defeated the Soviets and the Cold War was over, there were a lot of other big problems out there. I gave a speech, that one you're mentioning, I think is in December of 92, World Affairs Council, and said somewhere in there that uh, we were fighting with a dragon for 45 years, we finally killed him, and now we find ourselves in a jungle full of a lot of poisonous snakes, and the snakes in many ways are harder to keep track of than the dragon was. And I was thinking about things like proliferation and international organized crime and rogue states and so on. Um, and uh, people got used to dealing with the Soviets, and they took too much um, uh, of a sense that all our problems were solved now that we had defeated the Soviets. The Soviets uh, were kind of an ideal enemy for us. They weren't crazy. They were just uh, thuggish, self-interested bureaucrats with a cover story. I, by, the, by the late 50s, early 60s anyway, uh, after, after everybody had digested Khrushchev's 20th Party Congress speech about all of Stalin's crimes and so forth, I would wager there were at least as many true believing Marxist-Leninists uh, in the uh, bookstores of the Upper West Side of Manhattan as there were in the Kremlin. Uh, those guys didn't want to die for the principle of each according to his ability, to each according to his need. They wanted to work, they wanted to m modernize their dachas. Uh, and they had a terrible economy uh, that as we contained them and deterred them with, and formed our alliances and so forth, the economy just could not support what they had to have, and eventually it collapsed. And as it collapsed, they lost the will to sustain their, their empire. Um, they were part of the side of things, which they were a warped aspect of the Enlightenment, but they were rational. Uh, and what I said in that speech is we've got another set of folks the counter-enlightenment, uh, the distinction on Isaiah Berlin uh, uh, came up with. I've always thought he was marvelous. And the counter-enlightenment was far more emotion, far more religion, far more nationalism, uh, more Nazi than communist. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, I didn't foresee exactly what was going to take place at all with places like Iran and North Korea and the rest. 
But uh, I think people do make a mistake if, A, they say, since we won the Cold War, all we have to do is deal with these guys the same way and they'll be easy. They're smaller than the Soviet Union was. And by the way, they'll respond to, this, to deterrence and containment and so forth the way the Soviets did. They'll kind of sit there for a long time and then their economies will collapse. So what are we so bothered about? The answer is, I think, you've got to get inside their heads. And Hitler kept saying, beginning with Mein Kampf, over and over again, he was going to destroy the Jews and conquer Europe. And very few people believed him. And it was a lot harder to get rid of him, and we lost six million Jews and a lot of other people in the course of getting rid of him uh, because we hadn't stood firmly against him in the early and mid-30s when he was weak. Um, I'm very much concerned that people like Kim Jong-il or Ahmadinejad may mean what they say, and uh, we shouldn't take comfort from the fact that we defeated the Soviets one way and think that we can just kind of pick that whole business of deterrence and containment up and, and, and deal with these guys because, of course, they're not going to do anything crazy, but they might. In that uh, speech uh, and paper uh, that you wrote after the Cold War, you, you quoted Keynes, and, and I get the sense that you really think that ideas, when you yeah. say what's in people's head, yeah. you really think that ideas are important in, right. in motivating so people. It was a wonderful quote from the general theory about uh, uh, people are really slaves of academic scribblers of the generation before, and uh, people sometimes say that the world is not ruled by ideas, but Keynes said indeed the world really is ruled by little else. Um, and I think he was very right uh, uh, on that. Uh, it, it matters uh, uh, whether uh, or not an enemy is a self-interested thug with a cover story, but basically rational, versus a theocratic, totalitarian, genocidal maniac. Uh, you don't, if you try to get inside the head of each of those and think like them, and you have to if you think you want to defeat them, or even deal with them, uh, a Hitler, or perhaps an Ahmadinejad, is a very different kind of enemy than Stalin was. Mm -hmm. now, now, in terms of examining uh, the threats that we face, a, a lot of this comes together in uh, concerns about energy and the environment. So the first question I want to ask you is, how did you come to this problem? What led you pretty early on to see the environment, the dependence on oil as a, as a national security problem? Well, I've been an environmentalist for as long as I can remember. I, I, when I started practicing law uh, in uh, uh, early 1974, um, just out of the Armed Services Committee in the Senate where I was general counsel, uh, the first case I ever brought was a pro bono case for the Natural Resources Defense Council uh, before the Consumer Product Safety Commission to get them to recognize the problems with chlorofluorocarbons in uh, damaging uh, uh, the ozone uh, layer. Um, I uh, grew up uh, hunting and fishing with my father, Boy Scout camping, uh, mm -hmm. all of that. I've, uh, I've always uh, had a, a real affection for environmental matters, but what probably really pushed me harder than anything to get into this area was the arms embargo or the oil embargo of 73. Uh, I still remember sitting in the gas line. I was supposed to be running a hearing for the committee on armed services that day, and I was late to work because, as I reasoned, the Saudis had cut off our oil because we were trying to keep Israel from being overrun by its uh, neighbors. Um, I got fairly grouchy about oil um, that day, and I've stayed pretty much grouchy about it for the last 35 or whatever years. Um, I, uh, in the early 80s, uh, I was asked by a friend uh, to write the foreword for Amory Lovins' uh, book, uh, Brittle Power, about the vulnerabilities of the energy systems in the United States, a very prescient book. Uh, still, a lot of it is accurate, uh, unfortunately, nearly 30 years later. Um, and uh, I uh, started getting into the energy 
security issues in the 80s. I did some, um, some um, uh, writing and speaking uh, myself uh, on it. Uh, and then after I got out of the uh, CIA job in 95, I started spending uh, uh, more and more uh, uh, time on it, wrote a piece uh, with uh, Senator Richard Lugar on, uh, on called the New Petroleum, about moving away from petroleum-based fuels for transportation toward uh, biofuels. Um, I've uh, uh, subsequently come to believe very much that national security uh, and the environment and understanding the needs of what's sometimes called the bottom two billion, that is the approximately two billion people in the world that don't have access to affordable, usable uh, uh, energy, uh, that those three considerations together all need to be dealt with in figuring out where to go with our energy issues. And I've even uh, written several things and given some speeches utilizing fake uh, uh, conversations with uh, three uh, uh, ghosts who embody these different sets of views. One is John Muir, uh, all issues about the environment, uh, climate change, knocking the tops off mountains in Appalachia, all of the environmental issues uh, he speaks for. Uh, George S. Patton, because I wanted uh, uh, a figure that embodied real determination to defeat the countries and the West's uh, uh, enemies, uh, whether they're terrorists or hackers into the grid or, 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 uh, uh, or what. Uh, and uh, then my third uh, uh, figure that I, I write about is Gandhi, uh, because uh, one of the things Gandhi used to do on his marches was carry a, a charka, a, a Indian, small Indian spinning wheel with him. He'd spin cotton for a couple of hours a day while people watched. Well, why was he doing that? He was saying to the world, and particularly to people in the villages of India, don't uh, just sort of plant cotton and pick it and send it off to Britain. You've been spinning cloth for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, do it yourself and make the village stronger economically and, and otherwise. And uh, I think- Self-sufficiency. So, as much as possible. And I, particularly on the key things like, like energy. And I think uh, that, uh, set of ideas fits rather nicely into the notion of distributed generation of uh, electrical power and, uh, and of uh, biofuels and the rest. What, why, uh, and, and I recommend your pieces where you, you create this, this imaginary dialogue uh, as you just described, but why do you think it's so difficult in reality to have these conversations? Well, um, part of the problem is that three of the four largest industries in the world are uh, electricity generation, oil and gas, and automotive. And they've all three been on essentially the same business plan since the late 19th century. And mo many of the people in those industries would be perfectly happy staying on their 19th century business plans, uh, just updating the technology, but essentially drilling for oil and gas, um, uh, uh, creating fuels that can go into steel vehicles, the vehicle companies producing the steel vehicles that will use oil products and only oil products most of the time, uh, and the uh, uh, utilities uh, burning uh, uh, fossil fuels, mainly coal, uh, and, uh, and producing electricity and selling it to consumers. And when somebody like Amory Levins or someone else comes along and says, time out, look, there are a lot of things about this that are dangerous and undesirable for all sorts of reasons, from putting carbon into the atmosphere to making it easier for terrorists to hack into a highly centralized uh, grid, electric grid, uh, to building up huge amounts of debt in sub-Saharan African uh, countries because of their oil imports. Uh, we've got to start getting together and, and changing some things, and these, some of these fossil fuels, particularly I think natural gas, will have a role for a long time. But um, we've got some serious problems with coal and oil, and we need to work hard on fixing them. Not necessarily getting rid of both completely immediately, of course, that's not possible, but, but working hard on steering uh, uh, away from them. And uh, one has those uh, industries generally on the other side of that debate. One certainly has uh, the Saudis. Uh, and the uh, oil, OPEC, uh, I mean, the, 
Our transportation is dominated by petroleum, 95-96%, and uh, OPEC has uh, about 80% of the world's reserves of, uh, of petroleum. Uh, so they're going to run the petroleum business. They're going to set the price within some limits, but basically they're going to set the price. And uh, that's a great danger to the United States uh, for, and will be for a long time in the future until we do something about it. Now, now uh, as a security analyst, let's put on your hat cap here for a second. And how is it that the, the case is so well overwhelming that the, the threat is real? I mean, you, at one point you say, we're funding both sides in the war on terrorism, right. basically. Right, we you are. point out that the, the, the OPEC uh, suppliers uh, essentially uh, 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 calibrate the price to sort of a move us away from going to alternative fuels and new technologies and so on. So, so it, it's such a clarion call and such a compelling case that, that uh, one has to be mystified by the, 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 the failure to act. I mean, is it, is it that uh, moving from the industries, is, is there a, a failure of political leadership, which, which you have talked about in, in parts of your career, witnessing that uh, even when, when you were head of the CIA? I think there have been some big mistakes made by those on the side I identify with or trying to move us away from coal and oil in particular. One is insufficient attention to oil. Uh, the cap and trade system, for example, was um, entirely, for all practical purposes, uh, about uh, um, fixed facility generation of carbon dioxide, not automobiles. A dollar a ton of CO2 in the uh, cap and trade system, a dollar a ton increase adds a penny at the pump. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, for $25 a ton CO2, which is a price level people were kind of talking about, that would add all of 25 cents a gallon to, to gasoline. Uh, cap and trade might have been, I think it's probably dead for quite a while now, it might have been one way, one reasonable way to get at uh, stationary sources of uh, CO2. But um, it was never a good way to get at oil, and oil is ha emits more. Uh, about over 40 percent of our emissions are from oil, and about 38 percent are from coal. Uh, oil emits more, and they haven't been dealing with it. Uh, I think um, so. I think that's part of, of the problem. Uh, we need a whole set of programs to move us away from oil, and not just toward. Mm natural gas, which will have a, a role, particularly in trucking, I think, and, and, and fleet delivery vehicles, not just toward biofuels, mm -hmm. uh, now ethanol and methanol, later biobutanol, algae-generated diesel, and so forth. And, and you're, you're suggesting to build cars that can adapt exactly. to these different fruits. Yeah. It would cost an American automobile manufacturer all uh, of about 30 or 40 dollars per vehicle to put a different kind of plastic in the fuel line so it could use methanol or ethanol. Methanol can be made for about 90 cents a gallon from uh, natural gas these days. Uh, and, and efficiency of internal combustion engines uh, can be radically uh, improved. Uh, you need to move forward with all of those mm -hmm. and, and sometimes those who are opposed to fossil fuels and sponsor different ways of going at it, form their firing squads in a circle, and the first people they knock off are, the, are their, their buddies, and they shouldn't. They mm -hmm. ought to, they ought to uh, work together. Uh, uh, we also need to move at, against stationary sources. Uh, since I think cap and trade is not likely to fly, uh, we need to find other ways to get at global warming gas uh, uh, emissions, like going after the hydrofluorocarbons, uh, not just CO2. Uh, but there are some things we can we can do about mainly coal is the problem, um, but uh, I think it probably won't be uh, cap and trade now. Uh, and and why it seems in in this case and in other areas we we recently had Alan and Thoben on when we were talking about health care reform that that uh, 
to make the, the kind of transformations you need in, in, in energy or in that field, it, it's really about changing the, the incentives. It's not, it's not overthrowing capitalism, right. but, but it's, it's coming up with legislation that, that creates a, a new environment where the consumer has a choice. Because you're arguing, right. and he was arguing, that the consumer right. doesn't have that choice. Exactly. Uh, we ought to use government on energy the way Teddy Roosevelt did, by breaking the Standard Oil Trust. Uh, it, Roosevelt didn't decide, and didn't have the federal government decide, what was going to compete with the, with the more limited Standard Oil. Uh, he let the market uh, do that. Uh, what we need to do is use uh, uh, open standards, uh, that is uh, requiring vehicles to be able to use uh, alcohol-based fuels, uh, uh, use electricity. We need, we need to incentivize competition with oil and cars made out of steel that just burn, uh, burn products of, of petroleum. Um, and uh, I, I think that's part of what went wrong with cap and trade is that cap and trade has worked for us as long as it was within the United States for sulfur dioxide and nitrous oxides and some of the acid rain uh, problems. But this cap and trade would have been worldwide a much bigger, much more difficult, much more bureaucratic undertaking. And so a lot of the people who might have thought, well, I can understand how we want to move away from CO2 and pollutants and so forth, might have signed on, were really put off by the big bureaucratic nature mm. of, of cap and trade. And I must say, that is something, I think Alan's right about that on health care. I think the people who want to have more competition, not less competition in, in energy, are, are right. And uh, I think it's quite possible to be in favor of some of these very fundamental changes, but not like big bureaucracies. If I might add an area I haven't studied, my wife knows a lot better than I. Um, I want poor people to have health insurance, but I'm not sure I like it being done in a 2,500 page bill that nobody has read that keeps setting up bureaucratic organization after bureaucratic organization after bureaucratic organization. So if one can change the incentives so that everybody has health insurance and there's competition in the health insurance market and across state lines and the rest, um, that's I think a better way to go. You've got to keep in mind the needs of the people who can't afford to function and have good health care in today's system. Um, compassion at home, strength across the seas, okay? But being compassionate does not necessarily mean setting up a big bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. Now, interestingly enough, the, when, when you talk, uh, and one of the things I think you're arguing is to bring the electronics revolution to the automobile. Yes. And, and also, at the same time, thinking about moving from a centralized grid to a decentralized one. Yes. And, and importantly, you point out that the, the centralized grid is really vulnerable to terrorist attacks. So, so again, we're at a situation where it, 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 we have to move beyond tweaking the system, and we have to uh, sort of figure out ways to benefit from what we do well. And there's a real threat out there. There is. There is. Uh, the, the big electric grid that we've got, with, which, which, uh, with its huge transformers that take several years to build and aren't built in the United States anymore, uh, that step up the voltage so it can be transmitted for great long distances, is a disaster waiting to happen. Uh, because the transformers are vulnerable to things as simple as rifle shots. Uh, the uh, the uh, uh, grid itself, much of it operates over the internet, and the internet, as uh, we've seen with Stuxnet and a lot of things recently, is certainly That's the virus that's attacking the, the Iranian. Iranian. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that it's certainly quite plausible that somebody could uh, try a Stuxnet on us. Uh, there are um, uh, a lot of problems with with such a heavy reliance on on uh, a large uh, centralized set of, uh, of uh, interlocking grids. We've got to be able, when something goes down, we've got to be able for people to at least be able to have enough locally generated power, I think from renewables and natural gas principally, uh, that they can at least keep some of the basic services going in their homes, even while 
even if they've had to shut down, let's say, the aluminum plant mm -hmm. just outside town because making aluminum takes huge amounts of electricity and you're not going to generate that for a long time with local solar and wind and small natural gas facilities. But you can start an evolution toward a lot more resilience in the electric grid. And um, I mean, I wrote a thing for Sandia, a, a fake history of the next uh, uh, 20 years, which has a time about now, the grid starts to go dark in one city a day and mm. then comes back up and everybody goes to general quarters, is panicked, and finally it becomes clear that it's a group of four teenagers in Tarzana, California who got bored with the video games and, uh, <laughs> and decided to take down the grid instead. And then in my hypothetical, some new video games come out and the new video games are much harder than taking down the grid. So they go on to the new video games and they tell the authorities, you guys are talking about having a smart grid. You don't have a smart grid, you have an ODAVD grid. And the authorities are really, what's ODAVD? And they say, ostrich designed, awesomely vulnerable dude. <laughs> now, now, in the, in this context, uh, if if we went to electric cars and we could plug them at night, then th this would be a step. So again, uh, it's seeing the whole sure. and how the pieces fit into a larger transformation. Well, we have a lot of extra capacity at night, mainly natural gas facilities that are the built and are there for peaking in hot August afternoons. But only about twenty five percent of our electric grid is utilized at night. So if you have time of day pricing that encourages people to charge their vehicles at night, uh, that solves a big part of the problem. There are some other changes you'd, you'd like to make, but I, I drive a Chevy Volt now that gets about 40 miles um, uh, before it cuts into need to use liquid fuel, but so it overall has a range of over 300 miles, but uh, three quarters of the cars in the country go less than 40 miles a day. So on three days out of four, on the average, my Chevy Volt is an all electric car. Uh, I have a Prius that's been converted to be a plug-in. It gets about 15 or 20 miles uh, all electric before it starts to use liquid fuel. And I have a diesel uh, pickup truck, three-quarter ton diesel, that uh, works uh, entirely on biodiesel. So, uh, you know, we, even with today's technologies, one can make some real strides in this uh, uh, direction. Uh, but uh, we've got to get with it. We've got to get the incentives there so people see those possibilities and take advantage of them, not that people get ordered to only use ethanol or ordered only to use natural gas-derived uh, uh, methanol or whatever. Uh, that n not to be the job the government's in. Uh, one of your uh, scenarios in a paper you did for Brookings uh, addresses the question of, of climate change. Yes. And, and the picture you're painting of the possibilities is, is is really uh, a clarion call to action and, and, and really frightening. Let's, let's talk a little about that because you, you, you see the scientific data is very clear, clear very convincing, and, and talk a little about that. I think it's important that the, the, by doubling or probably trebling the amount of CO2 in the environment, uh, we are, according to far and away the majority of, of climatologists, uh, we are going to have a substantial effect on climate change. They don't say that all climate change is anthropogenic. Indeed, they use words, even though they're quite clear that they think there is an effect, they use words like majority. Well, majority could be as small as 51%. But if you and I found out that whereas people used to think cigarettes had nothing to do with lung cancer, and then some people came along and said, cigarettes are the only cause of lung cancer. If somebody did some later studies and said, well, cigarettes are about half the cause of lung cancer, we don't still run out and start buying a bunch of cartons of cigarettes and start smoking five packs a day, right? I, I, I mean, uh, it, it, climate's complicated, and the models are not nearly as sophisticated as the climate. And it's perfectly reasonable for some of these effects to be a result of sunspots and, and tilting of the earth on the axis and other things. Uh, but there's enough consensus that human-generated global warming gas emissions are beginning to have an effect, even if, you know, one year to the next, it, it, the, the, the line doesn't go like this. It goes like this. So next year might be cooler than this year, but that doesn't mean that the trend uh, uh, isn't there. One of the things that's most dramatic to me, my wife and I have been diving in the Caribbean for 40 years, and uh, 
every time we go back to a place, it seems as if more and more coral is, is dead compared to the, the year, year two or three before. Senior Smithsonian uh, scientist who watches the oceans very carefully told me the other day that she was pretty sure that about 75% of the coral reefs in the Caribbean have gone in the last mm. 40 years and about 50% of those in the Pacific. And some of that is local pollution and so forth. But most scientists, I think, think a lot of it is carbonic acid formed by CO2 going into the oceans and changing the pH factor of the oceans just slightly, but it just takes just slightly. But every time I'm snorkeling and looking at this dead coral, I, I, I think, you know, it's yet another bit of data that uh, that looks very troubling to me. And and you you really uh, argue that the political consequences in terms of the rise of of uh, movements, in terms of interstate conflict and so on, could be quite drastic and oh. and really uh, enormous it, national security problems. Could be awful. Uh, I mean, a, a a rise of even a few inches, much less a foot or two, by the end of the century in ocean levels uh, is absolutely disastrous for places like Bangladesh and the Nile Delta and the Yangtze Delta. I, would, I mean, so you could be engendering very substantial movements of, of populations. In Latin America, in a number of key countries, um, uh, a lot of the uh, uh, drinking water and usable water uh, comes from glaciers, and the glaciers in a number of those places are retreating very, very substantially. Uh, if we think we've got immigration law problems now in the United States, what is it going to be like if tens of millions of our southern neighbors are increasingly hungry and thirsty because their water supply is, is not nearly adequate to, to, to what they need? Uh, and we've got to help them, but, uh, but we may at the same time be finding uh, uh, the seas lapping rather far into Florida, uh, because Florida is a pretty low-lying place. We, uh, uh, we need to think about different ways to get at this. Some of it can be dealt with by, by amelioration. Um, I mean, the Dutch have lived a third, with a third of their country below sea level for a long time, and they're really good at what they do. Um, there are things that the world can do to help deal with some of this while we get a handle on on getting rid of some of the global warming gases uh, and the rest, but uh, uh, we really do need to work on it. You, you've talked about the intransig intransigence of certain industries and the, the what, what I'm curious about is to what extent do we need to look outside of government uh, and, and the bureaucracies mm. To move to to generate movement toward yes. a response, and let's go back to your days uh, at at Yale and so on. I mean, what to what extent do the new ideas have to have a base in um, movements outside the system that help? Uh, to, to change the system and move it in the right direction? Well, one uh, place it absolutely has to be uh, local is electricity because we don't have a national electricity policy or the only institution is the Federal Energy, Res uh, 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 FERC, Federal Energy Commission. Uh, FERC uh, has some very able people in it. And uh, insofar as we might begin to have some national policies that could begin to, to uh, affect some of the incentives at the state level for the security of the grid and the like, I think FERC would be a, 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 a valuable institution. But the vast majority of decisions that get made about what's happening with electricity in the country is made at a state level in the public utility commissions. And they are going to be responsive to state by state voters for the governors that appoint these people. Uh, uh, so what you have to have is if you want to have what the Germans call a feed-in tariff, that is something that rewards small and medium-sized renewables uh, and rewards moving toward a, a distributed generation uh, of electricity, uh, we, uh, uh, it's going to happen state by state. And uh, so far more than the Congress uh, it ought to be the state legislatures uh, holding hearings, uh, responding to citizen groups, uh, 
uh, moving forward, and we have two states that have a feed-in tariff, uh, Vermont and, uh, and Hawaii, but if you have a big state go that way and people begin to see how much it, it adds to local solar, wind, biogas, uh, uh, generation of electricity and so forth, uh, it'll, I think things could start to move and along. And so uh, California is a case where uh, uh, leadership can occur it at, can, the, at, at the state level. can indeed. Lots about California is complicated, including their analysis of how to do a feed-in tariff. But if they, would, uh, if they would have a simple, straightforward uh, uh, system that helped, it's so sunny out here anyway, that helped uh, 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 distribute the, now it's a relatively slight cost for solar over and above uh, the, uh, say, natural gas, uh, and distribute to the rate payers in the, in the state, um, I think you'd see a lot of movement towards solar fast. I mean, the Germans have 18 tons per capita of the solar of the United States. Uh, there's one building in Germany, big building, has two megawatts of solar on it, Munich. That's more than the entire state of Texas. Hmm. And the reason is that we've only gone in for these huge installations that take forever to build. Um, I think that, uh, and this added cost in Germany, uh, for the average family home is about one euro per month. Mm -hmm. So, dollar and a half a month. But, and it's not a political issue in Germany. So there's, and there are 40 countries that have followed Germany in this, including now Japan, China, and India. We may be one of the last places to get small and medium-sized solar and wind uh, and in a distributed, distributed network way. Um, if uh, unless we can get some local grassroots effort in the states. Uh, one final question. Uh, our time is running out, but but if students were to watch this program, how how would you advise them to prepare for the future, looking back at, at your life story? I don't know. I uh, I took too much Latin and, and not enough chemistry and physics uh, for what I'm uh, doing now. Uh, I think anybody who has an aptitude uh, for the sciences, uh, uh, it's good to get into them. I've seen some incredible creativity uh, here in Silicon Valley and, in, and up at MIT and in Israel and various places where people from really excellent universities in the U.S. like Berkeley are, are, are doing incredibly creative things. We still do that very well in the United States. And if we get out of the mess we're in with respect to energy, it's mainly going to be with creativity. It's going to happen because, for example, we will be able through technology to make oil more expensive and dirtier than a new, much cheaper, much cleaner alternative. It happened to salt. My friend Annie Korn uses this example. At the beginning of the 20th century, salt was a really big deal. It was still the only way to preserve meat. Countries went to war over salt mines. Salt was expensive. And then with the coming of the electric grids, it's a lot cheaper to freeze and a lot better tasting to freeze and thaw meat than it is uh, uh, to soak it in salt brine. And uh, within a very few years, salt became boring. That's what we need to try to do to oil. Use technology to make it boring. Jim, on that note, I want to thank you for taking time to be on our program. It was My pleasure. quite informative. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history. Mm -hmm.